I stated in my book that there's more uh, false, falsely framed, and deceptive half-truths about domestic violence than any other significant social issue. I think that's a pretty extraordinary statement. Think of all the social issues we have uh, vying for our attention and say that there's more mis and misinformation about this issue compared to any other. Uh, but I was a daily journalist for 25 years in radio and television, so I, I think I can kind of gauge how things uh, work and there's ways to find that out and sort of test myself. Was well, it true? Isn't it true? And what I started to do was look at one factoid. Uh, as a friend of mine said in a presentation, well, you know, every 15 seconds somebody makes up another statistic. <laughs> but. Uh, in this area, they're more pervasive than, than ever before. And, and what I found was, I want to look at one little thing and then find out who said it. That was all. It was pretty simple, kind of straightforward. And I did not, I looked at a few instances in where advocacy groups themselves uh, made such a statement. Uh, but that was only kind of a little smattering. Didn't really want to look at them. I want to look at high government officials. I want to look at official uh, government agencies and so on. And the list I turned up with, of course, I had to stop at some point. It was 116 or so, and uh, I'll show you the list in a, in a bit here. Now, what was the statement? Well, the statement was that uh, domestic violence, uh, I looked at 116, basically, and this is what they said. Uh, domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women. Now, there were some qualifications to that. Most of them said it's the leading cause of injury to women 18 to 54, and some said 15 to 54. And Eric Holder really messed it up because he put it in African-American women. We have a recent example of that, and it was only that. He's still referring to the same stupid study, which doesn't say this at all. But anyway, so it's just completely false. But you know what I really thought was interesting was that, wait a minute, the leading cause of injury to women. I mean, that would be, that would be more than car accidents, right, in order to be the leading cause. It would have to be greater than household accidents. It had to be greater than, well, a whole bunch of things. And, and so who would believe that without question and just accept it, you know, without, without any, any, any thought? So I started looking where, who said it and where and so on. And so I come across, and this is related to something you wrote about recently, Christina, the Islam, the Islam it was called. And they said, well, you know, uh, American women are not treated, uh, in fact, they're treated worse than Islamic women are because this is not a jihadist site, it's a, call it a Islamicist site, pretty strident, because the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services said that the leading cause of injury to women in the United States is domestic violence against, and, well, wait a minute, <laughs> HHS said it? Oh, yeah, they said it, been saying it for eight years. It took me two years. Finally, a letter from my crazy congressman, who's really crazy, uh, it finally, you know, got HHS to reply at all, and they removed the statement. It took me two years just to get that off of there. And then they argued back with me in one letter saying, well, it's not the leading cause, but it's a leading cause. And I said, no, it's not that either, you dumb dumbs. You're supposed to be the leading health organization in the United States and tell people what is factual and not, and you can't get this right. It's just not possible. Well, I wanted to find out who else said it, you know. And, of course, as Christine has already told you the truth, what it is. Uh, more women are actually injured by animal bites in domestic violence. Male animals. Oh, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. Uh, okay, so anyway, uh, so here's, here's the list. And, you know, I'm just kind of kind of scroll through it while I talk. And I'm impressed by the little list because of who they are. This is not, you know, Joe Blow here. Uh, you know, it's, it's an impressive list of people. And these are responsible organizations. And I was really shocked. And they're Democrats and Republicans. And there's no discrimination here. They're Democrats and Republicans who repeated this. I was really shocked. Not only the Health, Health and Human Services Department, uh, but I was really shocked by, um, oh, let's see, the, you know, you got the Connecticut Department of Public Health and so on and so forth. There's a little advocacy group, not surprising there. Um, but then you go to, uh, oh, there's the Georgia State Department. And it, you know, see, Democrats and Republicans. We had President Clinton who said it, 
There's Rudolph Giuliani saying it. Encyclopedia Britannica, I thought that was good. They claimed, they made that claim. Um, and you know what I thought was interesting though was the Brain Injury Institute, they made the claim. And, they, and what was even probably the most surprising was the uh, Society for Emergency Physicians. I mean, they're seeing the stuff in the, hosp in the ER room and they think domestic violence is a leading cause of injury? It's just, just nuts. So, we, you know, advocacy groups can advocate whatever they want. You know, there's, there's still the flat earth society, they're out there. You know, go get them, guys. But it, it's up to journalists, at least, to act as a, as a filter for these claims and look into it. Far few do. And this issue, far fewer than any other issue I've ever come across in my years of journalism. Everything is accepted. Oh, well, they said it. They have God on their side, so it must be true. Let's not even look at whether it's true or not. And we could say advocacy groups say what they say, and then, you know, journalists do a good job or a bad job. Oh, well, who cares so what? The problem is all this results in policies that actually harm people, directly harm people. Now, let me give you an example of how that occurs. There's a thing called batter and invention programs. Every area in the United States has such a program. In brief, it's like this. If you're convicted or arrested on a batter uh, for a uh, battery, uh, domestic violence, you get a choice. You get a choice of, if it's your first time conviction, never had a felony conviction before, you get a choice. You can go to a very expensive trial, here's the bill, or you can go to class jail. And that's once a week for up to 52 weeks. Well, guess what most people do? I'll take glass jail. You know, sounds pretty good. And also, there's a little, there's a carrot. Usually, you get off on probation after you don't do any more harm to anybody else for five years. And well, that's pretty good. Not, I, I take it. I take it. The idea, of course, is that such classes will prevent future offenses. What's wrong with that? Absolutely nothing, except, of course, they don't work. In other words, you could have such a class, not have such a class, it wouldn't matter. And then that's from the National Institute of Justice, said that. So, why don't they work? Hmm, wouldn't class deal enough? Well, apparently not, because what they teach is something called the Duluth model. And I'm not going to go into the details of what all that means, but it's a made up, it's sort of like a made up program, just like they make up statistics. You know. Let's do something and see if it works. And if enough people accept it, then it does work because we get full employment. Because guess what? In these programs, you don't have to be a licensed psychologist to conduct such a program. No, no, no. Just be an advocate. You see how it works, how it begins to work here, and who it's full employment for? So why don't they work? Let me, let me read to you something. So this is from a state guideline for a batterer intervention program, okay? This is, from, this is what basically is the law of the type of program you can present. And, oh, no, do not present any alternatives because you can't get clients because the court won't refer them to you because you're not the approved program. This is prohibited. Offering, supporting, recommending are using couples, marriage, or family counseling. Identifying any of the following as a primary cause, poor impulse control, anger, past experience, unconscious motivations, substance use or abuse, low self-esteem, or mental health problems of either participant or victim. You know, I tell people this and they go, well, wait a minute. If they can't talk about any of those things, what do they talk about? Uh, well, you see, it's male privilege that causes, in the patriarchal society, which causes these men to batter their spouses. And that's all they teach. It's a blame game. No wonder they don't work. They're all alternative programs taught by licensed professionals. It's been my privilege to work with many of the leading sociologists and therapists in the country. And, you know, there's alternatives, of course. 
when it's sought by licensed people. We know that 20% of domestic violence is directly related to mental illness. We know that 98.6% of all couples experience violence in their relationship, experience violence in their family of origin. Duh. Substance abuse, of course, that's 80% involved. And yet, you can't even talk about it. And of course, family counseling, which most of the victims of domestic violence want, is not allowed. So we're not listening to victims, we're not helping perpetrators change their behavior. All we're doing, really, is even though the participants have to pay for this themselves, okay, but there's a system, of course, that supports it, uh, basically it's taxpayer-funded political re-education camps. That's what it really is. Taxpayer-funded political re-education camps forced upon people who, guilty or not, are going to choose class jail because that's what the lawyers advise and they can't spend the money otherwise. Then, of course, you get to the whole issue of discrimination. You know, I don't know. Recently, um, it became the law that uh, gays can serve openly in the military. I don't care what you think about that one way or the other. I really don't. But if we're allowing gay men to serve in the military and we have heterosexual men in the military, and you've got a big sign out front of that shelter, of that crisis line that says women only, I think that's appalling. I think it's abhorrent. I can't believe it occurs in this day and age in this United States of America. And there's a lot of lip service, tremendous amount of lip service. I love Kate Fillion's book from Canada. Didn't do well, but great book. That was the title, Kate Lip Service. Uh, in fact, we've proven it. It's a California Court of Appeals case. Twenty uh, shelters in the Los Angeles area were contacted, and uh, they all said, oh, yes, we serve men, too, the, the few that show up, you know, the very, very few that ever call us. Well, why would they call you? It's called the Women's Crisis Line, you know, the. And so they all said, oh, we, we, you know, we, we do, we do. But when they were tested, when a real man who had been abused called up, only one actually served. And that's the way it is throughout the United States. That's the way it is. And that upsets me, okay, because basically what we've come to find here is that there's myths and misinformation then they're not isolated to just myths and misinformation. They have real effects on real policy.